the, the migraine syndromes. The, the main place that you spend the energy that your mitochondria make while you're sitting here are in maintaining the ion gradients that these channels play on in your neurons. About one third of all of your metabolic energy only is dedicated to pumping the ions that, that are moving across your cell membranes. And, and therefore, if you have an inefficient coupling of these, you're going to deplete off. You're going to, you're going to use up. You're going to tap out the mitochondria's ability to keep up with what it needs to do. And, and, and in this same category of disorders, probably one of the most single important informative uh, 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 mutations in autism has been the Timothy syndrome mutation in one of these uh, membrane calcium channels. Because the kids have the signature finding of, of a specific fatal arrhythmia, cardiac arrhythmia, and over 80% of them have, have autism. Now, the arrhythmia we understand very, very well. It's a very specific cardiac rhythm problem where we can make exactly that same lesion by hitting any one of the other eight ion channels that contribute to the cardiac action potential. So we know exactly how that works. That was one of the first channelopathy diseases we came to understand. So we really know molecularly this is a disease that's caused because conduction of ions across the membrane is not working normally. Because the two phenotypes go together in this simple dominant pattern of inheritance tells us something very provocative about autism, but that it's probably the same kind of a mechanism. Because the kids who get one phenotype always get the other, and it segregates neatly through the families. And it's remarkable because there have been 13 kids identified so far who have this. Again, the notion extremely rare. This by no means accounts for very much of the autism. But every one of them who gets it has had their calcium channel broken at exactly the same spot. It's remarkable. So it gives them an excess current in their heart and presumably hyperexcitability in the heart and hyperexcitability in the brain of the underlying substrate. Now what we found in our own patients is we're able to see, just as I showed you, you're all now experts in looking at these heat maps, you can see a deletion in this region over here on chromosome 12 and all I'm going to tell you is that that region is where the same calcium channel is. So we've got a couple of kids here that we've now turned up that have deletions in this block that contains not only the Timothy syndrome channel, but also one of the channel subunits that interacts with the Timothy uh, syndrome. So, so we're very intrigued by picking up these, these mutations in genes that seem to reinforce this notion that there's a connection between the mitochondria and calcium uh, in these uh, syndromic presentations of, uh, of autism. Let me just skip over that and go to the very last one, which is uh, the last of the, of, of the migraine loci that we had identified. This is the, the locus number three. This is a sodium channel where we had found the second allele in this uh, sodium channel gene that causes familial hemiplegic migraine. And while we were writing this up together with Anne Tournay, we discovered that we had the second mutation that caused migraine in this gene. They were in these loops inside of the cell, and there were three familial autism families that had mutations in exactly the same places. Now, this is a gene that has hundreds of pathological mutations. They cause seizures overwhelmingly. Some of them cause ataxia, but they overwhelmingly cause seizures, and they're found in these transmembrane domains, in very different domains of the channel. And the domains where we're finding the migraine mutations and the autism mutations are in this area that involves uh, calcium uh, regulation of the channel's function. Again, putting us back into the same kind of pathway that other things have been hinting at all along. So, so with this set of abnormalities that we're seeing that are hinting at these energetic defects, either caused by mitochondrial mutations or, or nuclear mutations, and I had alluded to this possibility of, of stress because the kids look like they're exercising while they're just standing there. They're having this lactic acidosis, which wouldn't surprise you if they were running a race, but they're not running a race. We decided we would put together the kind of translational studies that are uh, embodied in our uh, uh, Autism Speaks and NIH Center to expand that phenotype, to let us see that phenotype with a higher resolution. And therefore, we've done studies where we're exercising the children, measuring uh, the uh, rare uh, gases, the studies that Sherry Rowland and Don Blake are doing on exhaled gases, looking at classical metabolites that we draw in the blood, 
uh, doing uh, 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 physiological monitoring of their uh, lactic threshold uh, and also trying to develop these, these novel uh, sensors on the expired gas and the transdermal muscle function. I'm just going to quickly scan through those. Let's see, we're running short on time. And, and, and now, of course, I'm going to explain to you some, I'm sure you've all seen the HBO special on Temple Grandin, uh, uh, the gifted brain functions that one can see in, uh, in autism spectrum. I can't tell you anything about the human brain. That's, that's beyond my level of complexity, quite honestly. Um, uh, when we want to ask a question about a brain, we work in a simple model organism where I can have some control over what's going on in a single cell. That's the level at which I can think about things. We've known for a long time that serotonin function is involved in autism spectrum. Uh, the kids have abnormal blood levels. We use SSRIs to treat them. When we, when we take a worm and we make them serotonin deficient, with that one lesion, we can change their development and the energy metabolism. In fact, we can hit one neuron in their brain and we can arrest their development and change all of the mitochondrial energetics in their body, the kind of thing that we had been seeing and grappling with in the kids that uh, had autism. And as we dissected this, because it's a very, very powerful genetic system, we were able to put together the pathway going from this one single neuron in the brain through a signaling pathway involving serotonin to insulin, insulin receptors, and a number of what we call transcription factors that turn on batteries of genes that are involved in stress responses and fat storage. So, so these, for us, become an intriguing catalog of genes to think about in the context of annotating the genomes of the individuals that we're looking at in, in autism. In the model organism, we can see more clearly into these aspects of brain function. So I would say that the things that together keep pointing us back to the role of this energy deficiency that led us to want to put together a center studying mitochondrial function in autism are the mutations we see in the mitochondrial DNA, the nuclear DNA, these defects that we can actually measure in mitochondrial function, in mitochondria's role in calcium signaling, and the kind of things that we're trying to develop with this expanded phenotype as well as in model systems. I just want to close by thanking all the individuals that have been involved. I think I mentioned uh, most of those involved in the autism studies in the center. Uh, 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 Doug Wallace, the director of the center, Sherry Rowland, Don Blake, Bruce Tromberg. Uh, uh, very important clinical collaborations with Pauline Filipek and Mark Lerner, uh, uh, as well as with Anne Tournay. Uh, and uh, uh, some of the genome centers in Finland that were involved in some of the gene discovery. Uh, and Ian Parker's lab here, as well as uh, collaborators at McGill on some of the migraine studies that we've done. And that's, I, oh, and funding from, importantly, from uh, Autism Speaks, uh, the NIH, and the Doris Duke Foundation. Thank, thank you very much.